that this course, which is uh, Introduction to Cultural Psychiatry, is going to focus really on the theory and the background to thinking about culture in mental health. It's not a clinical course in the sense of really talking about practical uh, clinical issues directly, although we'll, we'll certainly be talking all around that and, and uh, exploring that in different ways. Uh, the, within the context of our summer school, the course that deals with that the most is called Working with Culture, and it's taught by uh, uh, Drs. Guzder and Rousseau and others, uh, and that really talks a lot in practical ways about um, dealing with intercultural work and, and one's sense of self and, and uh, the interaction with other people. What you'll get out of this course is a, a variety of theoretical frameworks and some uh, understanding of the uh, research literature that helps you to think about culture in the broadest possible sense. And as you'll hear in a moment, that includes very much the culture of psychiatry, the culture of psychology, the sort of um, cultural assumptions that underpin a lot of the helping professions and mental health practices. Because our conviction is that the most general way to approach this is not with stories or stereotypes about different groups, but really understanding what is built into our mental health practice so that we can look at it critically and we can open up a little bit of space for dialogue with people who maybe don't make all the same assumptions. Uh, and that has relevance not only to clinical practice, but actually to basic science, to the basic kinds of uh, research and advancing our understanding of mental health problems. Uh, because as I say, the way that we conceptualize these things has a history, it has a cultural history, it's very much embedded in certain kinds of um, uh, social contexts and values, and only by understanding that can we understand uh, what is pretty generally applicable and what is quite specific to a particular context, or even maybe not helpful in that context, but just part of what the received wisdom, you know, that it's always been done that way, so we do it that way, even though there may be reasons for critiquing that. So that's, in terms of the underlying philosophy, what you're going to get out of this, I think. Uh, and uh, for that reason, as you'll see, the way that we structured this course, it's not around different ethnic groups. Um, because, uh, well, for many reasons, but primarily uh, because the only way that you can have any general knowledge is by thinking uh, in a cross-cutting way. And the examples that we'll use of specific ethnic groups are just that, they're examples to make a point, a more general point that could be used. Uh, because if you try to make a statement about the Indian family, let's say, it's going to be a gross stereotype and overgeneralization because there's so many different cultures and so many different languages and so many different social classes and castes and so on that what does that mean, the Indian family? But if we give an example of a different kind of family structure and how that might make a difference, it gives you a tool to think with in the future and, to, and a line of inquiry when you're meeting somebody new and, and that's really the generalizable kind of knowledge. So that's why you'll see that the core is structured around a series of themes and areas, partly around different types of mental health problems and partly around different contexts of work or different populations in terms of migration, in terms of indigenous people, uh, in terms of um, uh, those kinds of, of uh, uh, structural uh, and, uh, and demographic differences. So that's how we're going to organize our discussion uh, and these themes will be sort of twined uh, together. Um, it's, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, presentations, we'll have two lectures each uh, half day, uh, and we meet on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Friday mornings. At the end of the Tuesdays and Thursday sessions, we'll be showing films, and that's an important part, even though it makes for a very long day, I hope it's enough of a change of pace that it'll, you'll be able to energize yourself. I think we have some refreshments on the side, so all that should help a little bit. Uh, and the value of those films, I think, is that they give you a kind of vivid uh, set of images and set of, of context to think about. Uh, but it's also the case, as you've heard from the introductions that you just made uh, among yourselves, that we have a lot of diversity represented in the room. We have people from uh, different countries, different continents, different backgrounds. Uh, and I encourage you to use that as we go along. If something comes up that uh, resonates with some of your experience or you have a contrasting experience, please let me know, raise your hand, whatever, speak up, and let's, uh, let's introduce that into the mix because I think it's really the great value. I have to say for me, as, uh, in terms of working with this material over the years, it's been tremendously enriching to have the kind of diverse uh, groups that, who've come to this course. Uh, and it's also been a great sort of uh, 
grounding an error check in a way. If I give some example out of the ethnographic literature from some part of the world, there's often somebody in the room who says, well, wait a minute, uh, that's where I come from, and yes, that's partially true, but not quite so, and so on. And we kind of get a more realistic and more grounded sense uh, of what's going on. So that's the, uh, the kind of uh, format or backdrop. Let me say a few words about the larger context at McGill. Uh, the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry that I direct uh, is the oldest such program in the world, one of the very few and the oldest. It goes back to the mid-50s, uh, 1956, when um, uh, Ewan Cameron, who was the chair of the department at McGill at that time, uh, suggested to Eric Wittkauer, psychiatrist originally from Vienna, well known for his work in psychosomatics, uh, that it would be interesting to start a kind of program looking at cross-cultural issues. And so with Jack Fried, an anthropologist from the Department of Anthropology at McGill, they began this uh, program. And the real driving force behind that was the fact that at McGill, there were a lot of trainees coming to study psychiatry from different parts of the world, primarily from former countries of the British Commonwealth. So McGill was on the sort of mental map of people from Singapore and Hong Kong and other places that had that sort of British connection. Uh, and so uh, they would come here to train, but then the trainees would raise questions about what they were learning. And they'd say, you know, some of this is obviously applicable, but the way you're describing the typical patient with such and such doesn't really look like that back home. It re people really talk differently, express their suffering differently, and we have a bit of a translation, a conceptual translation problem. Rather than just viewing that as a barrier or an obstacle, um, uh, people saw it as an opportunity to really learn something fundamental about human uh, suffering, about uh, healing, and about the variations around the world. So they started at that time a kind of um, a newsletter uh, exchanging information, which eventually became this journal. It was first called the Transcultural Psychiatric Research Review Newsletter. Uh, and they decided that was a bit of a mouthful, so gradually it's shrunk in its title bit by bit until now it's just called Transcultural Psychiatry. And as of a couple of years ago, it's now the official journal of the section on transcultural psychiatry of the World Psychiatric Association, but it's essentially uh, published, uh, edited and published here uh, at McGill. This is the latest issue. I'll pass it around for you guys to look at it. Uh, and what it tries to do, despite the name transcultural, which was coined uh, at the time by Eric Wittkauer, it's not meant to transcend culture. It's really meant to view all clinical work as an intercultural interaction. It's really coming together of people from different backgrounds. And that's always the case, even if superficially you think you're from the same background of somebody that you're facing uh, in your office, chances are they have a different education than you do, different gender, different social class. There are lots of other things that are going to make their life experience different from yours in certain ways. And so there's always, to some degree, a kind of translation issue, an attempt to understand another person from a different background. It's only accentuated, sometimes dramatically accentuated, when you're dealing with people from different cultures, different languages, different religions, and so on. Um, so this was the problem that was posed by people in the 1950s uh, at McGill and that they began to get involved with looking at from a research point of view and to some degree from a training point of view. Uh, and uh, this is just a, another description of the journal. And then um, there are several units around McGill now. The way the division really functions is a kind of network of people who have an interest in cultural uh, issues. And so uh, my own unit based at the Jewish General Hospital, which is a community hospital located in a highly diverse neighborhood in Montreal, the area right around the hospital, around the Jewish General Hospital, 65% of the people living there were born outside Canada. And they come from 75 to 100 different countries. So that's typical of many places in Canada now, many places around the world. If you go to Stockholm and you go to the suburb Rinkeby, you'll find again about 60% of the people born outside the country. Uh, and so you have this dynamic in large cities around the world of what we could call hyper-diversity of huge numbers of people from different places coming and living together and posing challenges for how the healthcare system uh, will respond. Um, and my research unit, uh, we work in a number of different areas. One that we'll be talking about later in the course is Aboriginal mental health, having to do with the mental health of indigenous peoples. 4% of the Canadian population uh, count themselves as indigenous. And that's become very politically important because in recent years there's been a recognition of the act of suppression of indigenous cultures that occurred in Canadian history, and there have been some efforts to address that. So indigenous people have a certain amount of political voice, notwithstanding uh, some fairly uh, draconian things that the government just did in taking away funding and support for indigenous programs. Uh, 
but because there's been some recognition, at least, of the importance of these indigenous issues, this is one area in which culture has been brought to the fore, and we'll be talking about that uh, as we go along. The other area that we do a lot of work in is in immigrant and refugee health. Uh, so I've already mentioned that uh, the area around the hospital is very uh, uh, diverse with lots of newcomers. In fact, in Canada over the last 100 years or so, at any given point in time, somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of the population have been born outside the country. So we have a very long-standing history of this constant influx of newcomers, and it's really built into our collective identity. And that's one reason why Canada in the 70s and 80s became officially multicultural, and why many other countries look to Canada to sort of say, well, is there, you know, is there something you're doing that we could borrow or that would apply, even though many of the things that go on here, like anywhere else, come out of a very specific history and are not so easily translatable to other places. But I think it's still interesting to look in a comparative way, and that's something we'll be be doing as well. The third area that we are increasingly involved in is global mental health. As I mentioned, transcultural psychiatry at McGill began fundamentally as a kind of global mental health question. How well can Western psychiatry be transported to other places? Uh, but as you know, there's been a kind of renewed interest in global mental health in recent years. Uh, and our own concern is with trying to understand practice as culturally rooted so that the goal in global mental health is not simply exporting mental health like exporting Coca-Cola and McDonald's, uh, but really finding ways to work with local resources, local conceptions of problems and so on in a way that can be more effective and helpful for people. And to not only in terms of um, uh, delivering services, but to use those cultural differences to think more deeply about the nature of mental health uh, 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 and finally, uh, this area that I've already mentioned, the anthropology of psychiatry. So a lot of our work is in the area of philosophy of psychiatry, uh, ethnographic studies of psychiatry, trying to understand uh, what our everyday practice is like uh, and uh, what assumptions it makes and so on. Uh, and as I said already, I think that's the most general part of what we're doing. Uh, and for me, it forms the conceptual basis of all this other more specific set of questions that we can address. Uh, one of the programs that we have that you'll hear more about later that Dr. Jarvis is the clinical uh, director of and Dr. Guzder and I founded some years ago is a cultural consultation service. So this is a program that tries to provide cultural assessments and treatment planning of complex cases in the general healthcare system. And so it's an interesting clinical model and we'll talk about that later uh, in the course. And then uh, another thing that's based at our unit is the National Network for Aboriginal Mental Health Research. And these are all different websites. I'm not sure that the address is on. Here we go. Uh, and you can go and sort of explore those uh, at, uh, at your leisure. So here's what I'm going to talk about uh, today, uh, at least uh, hopefully through to, the, uh, to this uh, last point. This will be more for Friday, this last thing. Uh, but we'll try to cover this in, uh, in two sessions today, and we'll take a break uh, at the midpoint. Uh, I would like to give you a little bit of a history of cultural psychiatry, a kind of uh, three-minute history, a uh, very condensed and overview of, of what some of the main trends have been in cultural psychiatry. Uh, coming out of that, I'm going to be talking about the sort of legacy of colonialism in cultural psychiatry, which we're still struggling with in, in many ways. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, migration and cultural diversity, about globalization, how that's changing the meanings of culture, and then more specifically about this idea of anthropology of psychiatry and critical neuroscience. So just to make the broad point, uh, and I'll be defining culture in a variety of ways as we go along. For the moment, I'm leaving it as a kind of floating signifier. It means a lot of different things uh, um, necessarily, and it's not a bad thing that it has uh, this sort of broad and fuzzy meaning, uh, but we'll get clear about it as we go along. Uh, but here's some of the ways in which culture, grosso modo, is relevant to uh, psychiatry and to psychology and to mental health. There are a set of scientific issues about how does culture influence uh, our functioning as human beings? How does culture influence the brain? Uh, and how does it influence psychopathology? There's a set of social issues because everywhere we look, health is stratified according to culturally constructed identities and categories. Uh, people who are marked as having belonging to a certain racial category or social class or caste uh, may be at significant disadvantage in terms of access to health care, in terms of their own uh, health and well-being. Uh, 
Uh, there are ethical issues because uh, we as clinicians have ideas about what would be helpful to people, but they may not agree or they may not have set their priorities the same way. And how we negotiate those differences and what, you know, what we think ought to be done are not only practical issues but fundamentally ethical issues. Uh, more broadly, there are human rights issues in a variety of interesting ways. But to the extent that we understand human beings as fundamentally cultural beings, there's no human being who grows to maturity and able to function in the world without acquiring a culture. So culture is as essential to us as uh, air and water and uh, all the other things we need to, to flourish. Uh, and so the question is, do people have access to culture? Do they have opportunities to, to learn and to participate in all these different layers of communal knowledge and shared practices and so on so they can be full human beings? So in fact there are arguments, formal arguments in international um, uh, rights legislation for the right to culture and that has implications for healthcare and as for everything else in, in uh, society. And finally there are interesting political issues because the fact of the globe is of course great diversity. The fact of most societies is great diversity, even those societies that declare themselves to be homogeneous in some way, if you look more closely, often have lots of diversity within the society. People are just ignoring some of those things uh, because the whole process of nation building, of, of nations creating themselves as larger entities, has often involved certain groups gaining ascendance and ignoring the other levels of diversity within society or making them subordinate in some way. So to some degree, the whole project of creating apparently homogeneous political spaces ha has occurred by hiding the diversity within the society. So uh, this is an ongoing political issue, of course, because you get resistance and pushback from the groups that are being ignored or marginalized. And so we have a pressing question within most societies in the world, and certainly on a global scale, as to how we're going to live together with a high level of diversity. It's one thing if we all basically hold the same values and live in a similar way. It's another thing if we really have some conflicting values and we really want to live differently. And certainly in this society in Quebec, we've experienced some fairly dramatic debates in recent years around exactly these issues. And we'll talk about it later in the course, but we've had a whole debate around reasonable accommodation. How much should Quebec society accommodate to newcomers? And this is not an abstract uh, discussion. It's focused on very specific groups, uh, highly politicized, highly emotional, uh, and important in many ways, both uh, for healthcare on many levels, is important as a stressor because we see people who are experiencing uh, racism, discrimination, pressure from other people because of how they dress or how they act or who they're assumed to be based on how they appear, uh, but also um, an opportunity because I think in the healthcare encounter, in the clinical encounter, when people are at their most vulnerable and need help, there's an opportunity to make a bridge between people. There's an opportunity to respond in an open-hearted way, in a sincere way, in a very present way with people. And so to give them a positive experience of being listened to, of communicating, of belonging to a society. And so the argument is that this is actually a very important moment in the idea of building pluralistic, tolerant societies, which are basically the only kind that we are going to survive with long-term uh, as human beings. So all of these are interesting issues in their own right, and it's why I think that this area is the most exciting thing you could you know, approach intellectually, because it manages to put together some very profound um, questions about the nature of the human brain and mind and experience at the one end of the, at one end of the spectrum with very basic political questions about how we're going to go forward uh, as a diverse um, um, uh, globe. Okay, so here's my, uh, there's a, a cartoonist years ago called Stan Mack who used to produce these three-minute histories of something or other. So here, this is the three-minute history of, uh, well, it will be more than three minutes, I confess, but anyway, it's, it is nevertheless highly condensed uh, history of cultural psychiatry. And I think it's useful to think of it as having roughly three waves, although we may, there may be a fourth wave emerging that we can talk about. Uh, and the first wave we could call the, the, the period of comparative psychiatry. Um, and that had to do with asking some basic questions about the universality of mental health problems. And so it's there at the very beginning of the origins of psychiatry, and it's associated with the uh, earliest large-scale uh, migrations uh, in, uh, in modern history, uh, which were the colonial migrations. So prior to the colonial migrations, we had sort of explorations of the world. Uh, and I should say that much of this stuff, much of this literature, at least as it pertains to psychiatry, comes out of Northern Europe. So it's important to understand that there's a particular um, historical uh, 
uh, fulcrum for this and a particular perspective that dominates in these discussions. And that is uh, uh, this perspective of Europeans going out to different parts of the world and discovering things. My friend Fred Hickling from uh, 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 Jamaica, from the University of, of uh, the West Indies, is fond of saying that uh, Europeans didn't discover the Americas, they invaded the Americas. Uh, and of course, then they uh, expressed what he likes to call the European psychosis. They declared, everything I see is mine, which is kind of a crazy idea, but it worked, uh, I guess, because if you have enough uh, resources and uh, force and power inequality, you can impose your version of reality on other people. Uh, but the effect of this uh, migration was to bring uh, Europeans in contact with diverse peoples and uh, this was immediately fascinating to people, right? So you have all these travel logs and, and accounts of exotic things. And the more exotic, the better. What exotic really means is very different from us, a very different way that we do than we do things. And that was fascinating. And so you have this early writing uh, by uh, explorers and travel writers and so on. Uh, and also, at, from the earliest phases, missionaries, uh, people who felt for moral reasons compelled to go and save uh, the, the sort of uh, beleaguered souls around the world uh, to bring Christianity to them or uh, other religions in some other uh, cases. Uh, and um, in that process, uh, some of those uh, uh, people were very involved with documenting what they found. So we have early records of uh, experience and behavior with an emphasis on the exotic. Then we have this colonial phase when large numbers of people began to move uh, to be able to exploit the resources and the wealth of different places that they found. And with that, they began to build up institutions in the various places that they were occupying. And those institutions began to include various institutions of social welfare and social control. And at an early phase, those began to include things like asylums. So you began to have a small amount of mental health work and mental health observation going on in these colonial contexts. And that's where you see the emergence of this earliest phase of comparative psychiatry. And indeed, along with the earliest phase of modern psychiatry, which is often pinned on uh, the person of Emil Kraepelin these days, uh, who was a, a, a German psychiatrist, who was important for his efforts to systematize uh, notions of diagnosis, some of which uh, persist uh, in different form up to the present. And Kraepelin early on became interested in the issue of cross-cultural uh, applicability, of the generalizability, of the perhaps universality of the, con of the concepts and constructs that he was developing. And so he, in fact, made uh, several voyages. He made a voyage to Indonesia, and he went to see patients in the asylum uh, in Indonesia, in, in uh, Jakarta, to decide were they the same as the patients that he was seeing uh, in uh, Germany. And he concluded something not too dissimilar to what we would probably say today, although he did it in the language of the, of the time, which nowadays we would hear as being frankly racist. Uh, and so he said, based on a comparison between the phenomena of disease which I found there and those which I was familiar with at home, the overall similarity far outweighed the deviant features. So he could find similarities. There were differences, however, and those differences he attributed to the lower level of development, educational and otherwise, of these uh, uh, um, uh, subaltern people in, uh, in Indonesia. So this, as I say, is the beginning of a whole style of observation and explanation that went on uh, 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 until very recently, in some subtler forms, perhaps it goes on up to the present, uh, where there is an implicit standard of what is uh, normal and what is healthy and what is mature that is Northern European, and everyone else is somehow ranked in some way in, in relation uh, to that. Um, so the expression of this sort of colonial view within psychiatry, which can be found in many other writings, in uh, the writings of uh, Antoine Poirot, uh, a French psychiatrist, colonial psychiatrist who worked in the Maghreb in North Africa and had a huge influence across that whole region in building up basic uh, mental health institutions. In uh, many other writers, uh, we'll talk about a few of them as we go along, uh, were a variety of these uh, elements that were uh, central to the notion of uh, colonial psychiatry. First of all, as I've already mentioned, the idea that there was a developmental hierarchy. That not only did individuals go from sort of infancy to maturity, but in some ways you could rank uh, cultures or societies or civilizations on the same thing. Uh, and as I say, uh, ironically, perhaps uh, always the, the most advanced society was the Euro Northern European society of the person who was making these uh, ratings or evaluations, uh, impl uh, implicit or explicit. 
Another characteristic of the colonial psychiatry was it was typically from the point of view of the asylum. Uh, the people who were involved, uh, there was no community psychiatry to speak of. They often did not speak the language very well. They were not spending time in the community. And so they were seeing uh, a very narrow slice of the range of problems that existed in the society and the ways that people would deal with them and so on. And in effect, they were seeing only the most severely ill, the people who had, in a, in a way, been ostracized or been uh, extruded from their family, from their community, and sent off to the asylum for, for care. And so it's from that narrow window and from that extreme end of the spectrum that they were then describing uh, problems. Uh, built into this was this uh, issue of exoticism. And it's probably worth saying something fundamental about that, that I think it's a very natural thing for human beings to be curious about uh, people who are different. Uh, novelty in general, of course, is one of the most powerful motivations uh, human beings have, the search for novelty. You could argue that uh, it's uh, uh, as intense as our desire for sugar or uh, other kinds of things that we get into trouble with uh, once they're made available. Nowadays, uh, with the internet and with the vast amount of stimulation people have, we see a whole new set of pathologies that are related to just the pure desire for novelty, for stimulation. But this has existed throughout human history, probably was an important motive force to help us to explore and expand and occupy all the different niches that we do all around the world. Uh, so there's always been a fascination with the exotic situation, the novel other. Uh, and in fact, in the 1800s, uh, in, uh, in uh, French literature and other places, there was a whole um, kind of romantic view of the other. You think of Gauguin going to Tahiti as a prototypical example, and it was highly eroticized, in fact, that there was uh, a notion that the other, the, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, person of an, another sex from another culture was inherently fascinating and desirable in some way. So this is one pole of a dialectic in our experience. The other pole is the fear of the other, uh, of the idea that people are un unknowable, unknown, uh, mysterious, dangerous in some way. So you have these competing uh, emotions, powerful emotions activated when people from very different backgrounds encounter each other of attraction and of fear and repulsion. And it's probably worth keeping this in the background even when we're talking uh, about um, psychiatrists or uh, researchers or other people who are supposedly doing this formal scientific work to keep in mind that there's some very basic powerful emotions that are at play in these same situations and that are probably exerting all kinds of distorting effects on the things that people are talking about that they're very fascinated by certain things, they're captivated by them, and they're repelled, and that they're sort of working with those as they go along. So, I guess, segueing then from this idea of exoticism and the power of exoticism uh, and the distortion that it then gives, because what you have as a result of exoticism is people describing only the most extreme aspects of situations. That's what they're fascinated by. They're not spending writing pages and pages about how, you know, these people are just like us and they do all the th same things as us and, you know, look, 90% of what they're doing looks the same as us. That, that isn't very interesting to read. What they're looking for is what are they doing that's really weird from our point of view and then we can write something about it and everybody will want to read it and it'll capture a lot of attention. So that puts a, a built-in distortion into all these discussions when, when you approach it that way. Um, at the same time, as I mentioned, not only was there this developmental hierarchy, but there were deeper notions of people uh, having essential characteristics in some way uh, that were attached to systems of uh, uh, racialized categories and racist uh, discrimination, racist ideology and discrimination. So the notion was there are different kinds of human beings in the world. And you can tell who they are. You can tell by the color of their skin or the, or the quality of their hair or the shape of their eyes. And this tells you something fundamental about people. Uh, uh, in fact, even in some cases raise questions about are these even really people? Maybe they're not people. Maybe they're another species altogether. But even if you embrace all these uh, variations of human beings as people, maybe it still represents a kind of hierarchy. And again, since the people doing this were usually pale-skinned people uh, from the north uh, who had uh, these uh, genetic polymorphisms that prevented them from producing much uh, mel melatonin, uh, they tended to see the people who were darker, who were a whole variety of other things, as being uh, in some ways inferior. And the crucial thing about race in this context is that it is uh, ascribed to people. It's not a biological reality. It's attached to people based on certain superficial characteristics. And it's viewed as an essence in some way, that it's not just one of your characteristics, but somehow it's getting at the core of who you are or uh, what's going on for you. And so it 
What follows from that are a lot of assumptions about who people are and, and so on. This carried over through the colonial psychiatry in the 50s. Uh, J.C. Carruthers, a British uh, psychiatrist working in Kenya, uh, wrote about the African mind and suggested that Africans had undeveloped frontal lobes, which is why they didn't express much guilt when they had depression. Uh, and he viewed this as an intrinsic characteristic of the African brain. The, the, his uh, monograph on this was published by the World Health Organization, uh, so it was endorsed by these uh, big international uh, organizations. And there's a generation of African psychiatrists, uh, black African psychiatrists, who studied psychiatry from textbooks that were saying that they had uh, these uh, defective or, or immature or uh, deficient brains. So as I say, to a contemporary ear, this is clearly kind of racist uh, talk and thinking and very problematic. Even at the time, there were anthropologists and other people who wrote very negative reviews of his monograph and you know, uh, sort of uh, you know, recognized it for what uh, we would understand it to be now. But nevertheless, this kind of thinking and talk was much more acceptable, much uh, broader, even within uh, science and, and within uh, the professions uh, than it would be now. And it's important to recognize that that's 50 or 60 years ago. So we're, and, and we can find many more recent examples of, of uh, these kinds of dilemmas. In fact, we'll talk about some later. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> racism was built into a lot of this discussion. Um, because the desire was to, on the one hand, establish universality or show that there were things that clearly were not universal, things get polarized into, yes, this er, argument's like everybody's essentially the same, or no, this is absolutely unique, rather than, uh, as we'll try to argue in this course, a more refined interactional view that says, look, everybody uh, shares lots of things with other people and also has unique characteristics, that that's, that's to be expected. And that would be a more balanced kind of uh, approach to these things. There was a tendency to sort of dichotomize into these universalistic arguments or very singular, no, these people have this thing that nobody else has and it's completely unique. And that was expressed in this idea of culture-bound syndromes, the idea that there were certain kinds of pathology, certain kinds of problems that only existed in some places, were only found in certain cultures, and somehow were uniquely characteristic of, of, um, of people within that culture and of the kinds of pathology. So I'm going to say more about that in a moment, but the point to be made about this kind of uh, colonial psychiatry is even though in some ways we feel we've moved a bit from there, and we'll try to argue that we're sort of have a kind of post-colonial psychiatry, at least possible for us right now, uh, there are many traces of this colonial thinking throughout contemporary psychiatry. And so part of what I hope you get out of this course is sort of a, a, a critical way of thinking about these issues so that you can contribute to the kind of... Um, uh, ongoing enlightenment of psychiatry that sort of, uh, could occur from a real dialogue between people. These are the things that I think are still built in in certain ways. An assumption uh, that you can sort of have a hierarchy of cultures or peoples that go from primitive to uh, civilized. One expression of this we'll talk about in the next, uh, on, on Thursday is the whole discussion around somatization. Uh, in most people in most parts of the world when they're emotionally distressed have physical symptoms of distress. Within Western psychodynamic psychotherapy, there was a very strong tendency to say that's a more immature way of expressing suffering than it is to say, I'm very depressed, I'm very anxious. So psychologizing is sophisticated and somatizing is primitive. Um, but as I say, the reality around the world is that uh, everybody has somatic symptoms when they're distressed, so what you focus on depends a lot on who you're talking to and what's at stake and what the options are and so on. It's not that people are unfamiliar with these different facets. Everybody everywhere understands there are many different facets to suffering, but, uh, but this notion that there was a hierarchy built in really came out of that, uh, that history. I've already mentioned the fact that all this colonial work was done from the point of view of people working in an asylum, sort of looking for, and from the point of view of professionals, not going into the community and saying, uh, how are people dealing with this in the community? And maybe there are lots of people with similar problems who don't end up in the asylum, uh, but you know, it's being managed a whole other way. So that was not in, uh, uh, being looked at very much. Uh, there's an implicit assumption behind, in all this work that we already know what the main kinds of mental health problems are. Uh, that those were arrived at through, uh, you know, uh, um, through the development of medical theory and practice and through science, and those are putatively universal categories. So that's also kind of an assumption. And that when we do recognize cultural difference, we frame it as these culture-bound syndromes. So psychiatric diagnoses are not culture-bound, they're universal, but then 
people around have their own little idiosyncratic categories. So we have this sort of contrast. Generally, when you're coming from this perspective, then cultural difference is mainly just a problem of, of communication. It's just a barrier to applying the general knowledge that you assume you already have. Uh, and you assume also that you already know what the best treatments are. So let me say a few words about culture-bound syndromes because these are, this is one, um, one legacy of this colonial perspective that we, uh, we still have and is enshrined, in fact, in official psychiatric nosology. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about this later, but uh, we're assuming in this course that you all know a little bit about psychiatry and a little bit about anthropology. The, one of the things you need to know about psychiatry is that uh, psychiatry, contemporary psychiatry works with diagnostic systems, with categories, and the ca current official system in the United States, which is a de facto uh, standard uh, in, around the world, is DSM-IV-TR. And DSM-IV-TR has about 300 diagnoses in it. Uh, and these diagnoses all have specific criteria. And I'll say more about DSM at the end uh, today. But um, in uh, Appendix I, the second to last appendix in DSM-IV, uh, there is a glossary of uh, culture-bound or culture-related syndromes uh, and idioms of distress. And DSM lists 25 of these. And it describes a culture-bound syndrome as a recurrent locality-specific pattern of aberrant behavior and troubling experience that may or may not be linked uh, to uh, a specific DSM-IV category. Now, I should say just a few words about how this came about, that DSM has this uh, appendix with these uh, disorders. Here are the 25 uh, things that are listed. And they're each listed with a name and with uh, one or two sentences describing them very briefly. Um, this is a glossary. It was meant to be a glossary. There was a work group, a National Institute of Mental Health work group on culture and diagnosis uh, convened uh, around 1990 to work in tandem with the development of DSM-IV. Uh, and that group developed a lot of text for the different disorders in DSM-IV that would be describing cultural facets. And some of that text mentioned certain kinds of cultural variations, which are represented by these culture-bound syndromes. And so with the idea that there'd be all this discussion in the text of DSM-IV, it was thought, well, it'd be good to have a glossary at the back. So if somebody encounters a word like taijin kyo fu shou, and they're wondering, what is that? They can flip to the back, and they'll get a definition. Unfortunately, in the process of negotiating over what role culture would, would have in DSM-IV, a lot of the text got cut. And so you end up with a little bit of those cultural comments in DSM-IV, which is already a very fat book, so we understand the editor's anxiety about finding ways to contain the, the material. Uh, and you end up with these definitions at the back of the book, which then become a little bit disconnected from the rest of the book and form what I've called in the past a kind of museum of exotica, uh, that it's just these little strange things listed there with very little definition uh, and very problematic because if you just take one or two sentences describing something and you try to apply that like a diagnostic tool, uh, you're going to run into a lot of trouble because you're not getting enough information to really know what is this, how does this work in context and so on. And one of the problems is if you actually look at this, uh, these are all different kinds of things. They're not all culture-bound syndromes in any particular sense. Uh, but an even deeper problem, well, uh, I'll come to that in a second. So there have been efforts to approach these as culture-bound syndromes and to group them together uh, in different ways. And so this is a list from the work of uh, Ron Simons and Charles Hughes some years ago in a book on culture-bound syndromes, a book, incidentally, where they listed about 250 culture-bound syndromes. So the 25 that are listed in DSM are a little bit arbitrary. They were chosen because they were the ones where there was the best literature, the best uh, research that had been done, where there was some chance that they might occur in the United States because there was this whole tension about should we really put, this is just a nosology for the U.S., really. Should it have everything in there or not? There was this sort of tension back and forth about how inclusive to be. Uh, and they, uh, you know, so, so fa some fairly arbitrary reasons why things were chosen. And this is their attempt to group all the ones, the 250 or so that they found, into some broad categories. Startle matching. Uh, these are syndromes in which uh, somebody experiences a startle and then they show uh, echopraxia and echolalia, that is, uh, after being startled, if somebody's doing something, they will make that same gesture. They'll copy what they see the person doing. And the prototype of this is something called lata, which is described in Malaysia. And I'll show you in a moment perhaps a, a film clip of, of, of lata. In fact, maybe I'll show you one right now before we go further. This is a little bit... 
maybe a little bit tricky. We'll see if we can do this. This is a film by Ron Simons on Latin. I'll just, it's, a, it's a long film. I'm just going to show you a couple of minutes of this, and he explains at the beginning. So this lady is making this violin-like movement and this lady is compelled to copy her. Well, I won't, I won't show you more because it'll take too long to show it now, but um, let me just say that uh, what happens in Lata is that a person uh, is startled and they freeze and then they will copy what another person is doing in gestures. They may also, rather than freezing, they may suddenly shout swear words or do other kind of socially inappropriate behavior. Uh, and so, uh, the way that Ron Simons is framing this is, is a culturally elaborated, um, uh, a cultural elaboration of the startle reflex. So that we all have a startle reflex. Babies have this very dramatically. They show kind of moral reflex when they're startled. Uh, adults retain some elements of this that can be uncovered. Some people startle very easily, right? And we can all be in a state where we startle more easily or less easily. In fact, the way that a lata occurs in Malaysia is you can create a lata. Basically, the people in the film explain, if you want to create a lata, you just start startling somebody, and you do it over and over and over again, over days and days and days, and eventually they become very sensitive, and they startle more and more easily. Uh, and then uh, this can be then uh, a source of entertainment and amusement, as you saw in the clip uh, in the village. So uh, this was framed as one of the uh, DSM uh, culture-bound syndromes. In fact, Ron Simons wrote a whole book on Lata called Boo, uh, which is a good title, I think, for a discussion of startle. <laughs> and uh, the, the point is, though, that this is actually not an illness. Uh, people don't come for help to the, the doctor for Lata. Uh, and in fact, it's a source of entertainment uh, in the community. It's also, even though you may view the person who's being sort of mercilessly uh, poked and, and nudged to become the Lata as a kind of victim, they also get a certain kind of uh, release from it because they're allowed to say and do things that would be unacceptable. I mean, in the Malaysian Muslim community where a woman must maintain a lot of propriety, when she's a lata, she can say outrageous things. In that moment of startle, she can curse, she can swear, she can say all kinds of outrageous things, she can make sexual, uh, sexually provocative uh, gestures and so on. So you could argue, from if you step back from it a bit, you could say, okay, so this serves some kind of social function for people of release, of protest, of catharsis, of a kind of dynamic both in a personal level and at a social level. But it's not clear that it's an illness. Uh, it could become a social problem for someone if they really feel that they're being tormented, kind of being bullied, kind of analogy to, to being bullied or something. Uh, but it's not uh, a specific illness. So one of the issues about these different categories then is Depending upon the example you choose, your idea of what a culture-bound syndrome is is going to be very different. Um, there's, uh, uh, let's say, the next category here are s sleep paralysis. So sleep paralysis is a, um, a sleep disorder in which you wake up uh, um, from sleep, but you retain that aspect of REM sleep, of rapid eye movement sleep, in which your muscles are all paralyzed. Right? Every night when you dream, 
during the dreaming period, your muscles, except for your respiratory muscles and so on, are paralyzed. And that's so that if you dream running up the stairs, you're not literally running up the stairs and falling out of bed and all this other stuff. It serves a good function uh, to have that temporary muscle paralysis. But if you wake up and these components of sleep are getting dissociated, so you're actually awake but you can't move your body, it's a disturbing experience. It's a very frightening experience and so on. It happens quite commonly sporadically. Many people, many of you in the room may have had an episode of this. Um, I recall one episode I had many years ago where I, I, had, I had this, and what goes along with it are lots of other sensory experiences. So in my own case, when I had this, I felt as though there was a body lying on top of me. So that's interesting because what you find when you look across cultures is this experience of sleep paralysis gets elaborated in different ways. Uh, and in fact, the theory is that in the Middle Ages in Europe, when people were afraid a lot of uh, witches and of uh, the devil, and people would talk about the devil having slept with them, that it's possible that some of those experiences were people having sleep paralysis, and then having something like, let's say, what I experienced, where I felt a body lying on top of me, you could see how that would be very easily elaborated, the whole thing, with or without sexual feelings, could be elaborated into that kind of uh, story. There's a very interesting account recently from Richard McNally, who looked at people in the U.S. who reported being kidnapped uh, by aliens, alien abductions. And he, find, he interviewed 50 of these people and found that most of them had clear sleep paralysis episodes. So it's possible they're having this experience and then later trying to figure out what this could be and come across this idea of aliens and it all makes perfect sense suddenly. And some of their conviction about the fact that I really was abducted by aliens is centered on having this very powerful bodily experience that would give you great conviction that something definitely happened. I know this weird thing happened. So that's another kind of syndrome. The first term there is actually an Inuit uh, word from uh, the, the Arctic. And the other old hag is a term that's used in Newfoundland in Canada because people who are more prone to have these are people who have disturbed uh, sleep-wake cycles, like fishermen who have to get up very, very early in the morning to go out fishing, uh, and other people like that who have disturbed uh, sleep cycles may be more prone to developing this kind of thing. So there's another example, a little bit like the first one, where you could say, well, there's a neurological basis here, there's a common neurological experience that then has been culturally elaborated. The third example, Koro, occurs uh, particularly in East Asia, in China, and, and uh, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, and it's centered on the idea, uh, that uh, a conviction that a man gets that his penis is retracting into the body, and uh, when it retracts all the way, he will die. So it's a very frightening experience, uh, and it occurs in epidemics. There have been epidemics in China and other places where hundreds of people develop this, and the idea spreads throughout a community, and people are very anxious and concerned. The fourth uh, category, sudden mass assault, or amok, is what we get the word amok in English from, to run amok, uh, and this occurred in uh, colonial times in Malaysia, where uh, a, a man would experience uh, a feeling of having been slighted, or humiliated, would brood for days, and then would suddenly run amok and kill as many people as possible uh, and have no recollection for his behavior when he was restrained afterward. Um, uh, and uh, So it goes on. Uh, uh, I, I won't say more about all these right now. But let me take the example just to show you the dilemmas with all these things of Pabloktuk. So Pabloktuk is described uh, among the polar Inuit as a problem in which uh, 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 a person suddenly becomes very agitated, strips off their clothes, runs across the frozen tundra, this is in the high Arctic, rolls on the ground, may eat uh, feces or inedible substances, and if not restrained, will die of exposure. I think I have a, a description in a moment here. Here's a description uh, of Pabloktuk, or Arctic hysteria. So this is how it's described. And you see how it's described in the typical language that we could call the sort of pseudo-precision of the DSM, where it sounds like there are these very specific criteria. You notice it's 30 minutes duration, uh, lasting up to 12 hours. Nobody, these are made up numbers. Nobody really knows these particularly. And part of the reason nobody knows these is because some years ago, the historian Lyle Dick uh, collected all the descriptions he could find, primary descriptions of Pabloktuk in the world literature, and he only found about 25 cases, some of which were only a sentence or two long. You know, she tore off her clothes and went Pabloktuk. The most, most of the detailed cases he found came uh, from the uh, uh, explorations of uh, Richard Perry to Greenland, uh, and when Perry arrived in Greenland, uh, he asked the Inuit uh, men who were there to please uh, help him map the land, so they went out on the land to map 
Uh, and meanwhile, the women were left behind, and he was concerned that the sailors had been at sea for a long time, so he encouraged them uh, to have, um, uh, take comfort with the Inuit women who were there. And so this is a situation that we now would understand as a very fraught, uh, exploitative situ situation. And it's in that context that some women became agitated. We don't know, there's no particular record whether they were plied with, uh, with alcohol or whatever else in this situation. Uh, and this is a woman who's gone Pibloktok who's hanging from a sling on the ship. And I don't know if you can make out the faces, but the men are kind of smiling and smirking uh, around. So when you see that context, at least when I see it, it's very disturbing to think that this got turned into a culture-bound syndrome of the Inuit because it seems like it's a story about the encounter between two peoples, one of whom is very powerful <coughs> and acting in, uh, consciously or not, a very aggressive way toward the other group, and that we would view this as a kind of uh, violence, of interpersonal violence, a kind of violent encounter. So something is being lost by taking the problem out of context, and there's a literature that goes on for 20 or 30 years in the anthropological literature trying to explain Pabloktok. Uh, all kinds of biological explanations. Could it be due to hypervitaminosis A from eating too much polar bear liver? Uh, could it be due to hypocalcemia because people don't get enough sunlight and they're vitamin D deficient and then they're, they're having a kind of tetany? It all seems kind of beside the point when you actually look at the historical record and you say, okay, this was a story that was written from one narrow point of view without the person standing back and saying, well, who are we to these people and what are we actually doing uh, with them? So this is one concern about the, all of this older literature that has led to the, the uh, creation of these culture-bound syndromes and their installation inside the DSM uh, is that you're, it's hiding this whole uh, social context, this whole, uh, these dilemmas of power that need to be understood in, in systemic uh, terms. So this is one fundamental uh, critique. Let me see how we're going to uh, approach this. Yeah, okay. So this is one uh, kind of fundamental critique of these culture-bound syndromes. Uh, and there's some other issues. Um, many of the syndromes are not strictly culture-bound. They may occur in some region more than others, but they can occur in other places. Uh, so, for example, uh, in Japan, there's this well-described syndrome of Taijin Kyofusho, which is interpersonal uh, anxiety. And it differs from social anxiety or social phobia, as it's described in the West, primarily because people are mostly concerned about offending other people. Uh, the way that social phobia was first sort of thought about and talked about a lot in the West was in relation to public embarrassment. So the most, in fact, it was not even viewed as a serious psychiatric disorder until the 80s. Most people who were dealing with social anxiety were working in counseling services at universities, and they're dealing with the students who said, I have to get up and give a talk in front of the class and I'm petrified. So this was a practical problem for that student, but it wasn't viewed as a big mental health problem in, in a larger sense. And it was only early, early 80s with uh, Leibovitz and others who began to document in the West that actually social phobia, social anxiety, was having a huge huge impact on people's uh, functioning. It coexisted with other mental health problems, and it could lead to a lot of disability. In Japan, there was recognition from the 1920s uh, that social phobia, social anxiety was a serious health problem, uh, but it was framed not only in terms of the anxiety of how you would perform in front of other people, but especially in terms of the idea that by performing awkwardly or inappropriately, which meant by staring at people too much or by blushing, you would make other people feel uncomfortable, and that was the problem. So this emphasis on offending other people, which fits very well with Japanese values on appropriate self-presentation and social presentation, was a kind of shift in, in the balance uh, of, these, of these problems. Well, it turns out that that very well-described syndrome in Japan, um, which from a Japanese point of view, Japanese psychiatry point of view in the, in the 30s and 40s, spanned uh, problems from mild problems that could occur among many people to very severe problems that were involved a kind of psychotic delusions that you were um, losing uh, boundaries of yourself and so on, that that was all viewed as one big entity, that that also occurs in Korea, uh, another society where self-presentation is very, very important, where appropriate self-presentation uh, causes a lot of anxiety. So the idea that things are rigidly bound uh, depends a lot on how you draw the boundaries and what the crucial elements are. And you can find some of the same symptoms everywhere. You can find a few people in North America who, who worry about this and so on. It's just not very common because it's not culturally central to how people are thinking about distress. 
Another key issue in looking at these culture-bound syndromes is not all of them are syndromes in the medical sense. I mean, a syndrome, which is an idea that was introduced by Thomas Sydenham uh, uh, several hundred years ago into medicine, is the idea of a coexisting group of symptoms, things that happen at the same time in the same place, and they hang together in a way. So it's, it's a proto-description uh, of an early description of a disorder or a disease. Uh, well, let's say disease, because in a way disorder, which is a term that's used in DSM, is a way to dignify syndromes, uh, because that's mostly all that we have in the DSM, as we'll come to. Um, so if you look at these 25 things that I was showing you earlier, some of them are clearly not syndromes. Susto, for example, which means fright, fright illness in Central America, uh, some parts of South America, uh, includes all kinds of different problems. Anything that's caused by fright could be an example of susto. So tuberculosis could be susto. A woman who is, walking, is pregnant and is walking along a path and is startled by a snake and later gives birth to a baby that has a cleft palate, that could be susto. The fright caused the illness. So this is not a syndrome. It's many different things. It's a common explanation for problems. Doesn't mean it's not important. Doesn't mean it isn't useful to know that this is what people think and what they're worried about and so on. But it's really misleading to frame it as a syndrome at that point. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to, in a moment, some of the other things that these things uh, involve. Um, I've already made the point with the example of Pavloktok that this uh, approach to cultural variation in terms of culture-bound syndromes, focusing in on the syndrome, tends to decontextualize the problem. So you end up with things like Pavloktok, and instead of talking about what colonial encounters are like and what kinds of stresses and strains they may cause for people, or what kinds of violence may occur, you end up looking for, you know, uh, calcium uh, metabolism problems or some other kind of fictional explanation for a problem uh, when you've sort of ignored the obvious reasons by, by bracketing off the context, that you've missed the, the most obvious explanation by just looking narrowly at the symptoms rather than at the context the person's living in. And finally, uh, interestingly enough, none of the other diagnoses in the DSM are culture-bound. Uh, only these ones that were found in other places. Uh, but at the time the DSM-3 at least was introduced, uh, things like anorexia nervosa did not exist in many parts of the world as far as we know. They were very exceedingly rare in other parts of the world. Uh, that has changed. It's changing as we speak. Um, but uh, I was just in, in Singapore uh, a few days ago and visiting Singapore General Hospital where the psychiatry department focuses on eating disorders. Uh, but if you go back 20, 25 years ago, Chinese societies and, uh, and other, many other places uh, did not have significant amount of eating disorders. In fact, in general, you can say in societies where there's not a lot of food to go around, uh, being a little bit uh, rounded is a very good thing. It's a sign of health and wealth. That's how it was for most of human history. It's only when you get situations of superabundance of food, where people can then get into trouble overeating and you start developing obesity, that in parallel you begin to develop people restricting uh, and getting into uh, eating disorders. And coupled with that kind of inherent problem of, uh, of um, uh, over uh, consuming and then trying to control your weight are the promulgation of ideals of body image and so on that become very problematic. So we have represented in the mass media uh, images of um, uh, what is an attractive woman uh, that are often very slim, very uh, um, uh, even emaciated, and that becomes a uh, pressure on young women everywhere to sort of uh, adhere to that and the interaction between that and the possibilities of over controlling food give rise to these eating disorders. So you could argue that uh, eating disorders are also culture bound. It just happens that the boundaries keep enlarging and more and more uh, societies are involved but there are cultural elements that are important for eating disorders really to become widespread. So I say almost any problem could occur sporadically. One person can have their own idiosyncratic reasons for getting into certain kinds of vicious circles. But when you find large numbers going on, there must be something shared uh, in the environment that is having a, a broader influence on people. Okay. So these are candidates for Western culture bound syndrome. I mentioned anorexia nervosa. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, we had a, an epidemic of multiple personality disorder in North America. Uh, it was not common anywhere else at that time. What was common, and still is common in most parts of the world, are possession experiences. And you could argue that the capacity to experience oneself as being possessed by another spirit or being or something is a common human experience. And that what happened in the West, in North America, in a highly individualistic culture, is that people got possessed by fragments of their own personal histories. 
uh, since you're living in a secular culture where uh, you know, the, the gods and, and, and monotheistic tradition and so on, where many gods were not necessarily available to people to, to sort of uh, occupy them, that they would still have some of the same dissociative experiences, but what they'd be occupied with was, well, this was when, me when I was five years old, or this was this other kind of thing. Um, but that's not how it was framed, I should say. It, is, it may be how it's going to be framed in DSM-5, so we'll come to that later, but we're just in the midst right now of producing the new uh, nosology that should come out next year, and thanks to the work of Roberto Luis Fernandez and Edsel Cardenia and others, there's been an attempt to broaden the criteria of dissociative identity disorder so that it would include the possibility of pathological possession. But the caveat there, and we'll talk about this more next uh, Tuesday, is that in most contexts in the world, possession, including spirit possession, is not an illness. It's actually a healing practice. It's actually a cure. It's actually something people desire and seek out. So before you start applying a pathological label, you need to look very carefully and decide, is this a problem or not for the person? Is it uh, abnormal in a sense? Is it, is it pushing against the cultural norms? Is it causing disability? You have to have all these other criteria before you can say, yeah, this is really a problem for the person and we need some way of thinking about it and maybe we can help them. Uh, the next one is a very interesting one, again, related to things we'll be talking about later. We talk about also about psychotherapy. And that's the notion that uh, in the DSM, uh, there's a, a possibility that you can have a dependent personality disorder. That is, you're overly dependent on other people. And uh, in the uh, process uh, around uh, developing uh, cultural issues for DSM-4, there were a number of Asian American psychiatrists involved, and they pointed out that they found it very odd that there was a dependent personality disorder, but no independent personality disorder. Uh, and it spoke to certain cultural values, that is to say an anxiety about dependence and a notion that the normal developmental trajectory is that you go from being dependent on your parents to becoming completely independent. Maybe you go back once a year for Thanksgiving or something, but otherwise, you, you know, when you're 18 in the United States, you move out to go to college, that's the end, uh, and you, know, you have your, your minimal uh, involvement, versus the way that most people live in most parts of the world, which is to say lifelong close connections to their intimate family. If not living in the same household, then certainly being nearby and being involved uh, their, their whole lives. So from this U.S., we could say, or Western, highly individualized model of the developmental trajectory, all those different kinds of pathways begin to look problematic, like there's too much dependence there. Uh, and the blind spot is that someone could have a difficulty in forming normal dependencies and be anxious about them and have a problem there. Why shouldn't that, symmetrically, why shouldn't that also be a kind of problem? Uh, codependence is closely related to that. I'll just say something about the last thing, anger-related uh, disorders, uh, because again, this came from some of the Asian psychiatrists again involved in this process around DSM-4, and they pointed out from their point of view, when you look at the structure of the DSM, uh, this psychiatric nosology, these 300 diagnoses are grouped into big groupings. I have a slide in a few moments, I think, that will show you know, later on that I'll, I will show you that. Uh, and there's a grouping for anxiety disorders, and there's a grouping for dissociative disorders, and so on. But there's no grouping for anger disorders. And there's no logical reason why that should be the case. Uh, if you're, I mean, it's arbitrary anyway how you're grouping things, but you're grouping them around big uh, phenomenological themes, big character, you know, characteristics. Why not anger? Uh, there are some things that are, include lots of anger, certain kinds of personality disorders, and certain kinds of uh, impulsive or explosive disorders, but they're all scattered all over the nosology. So the argument was, this is again a blind spot, because to outsiders coming to the United States, what with road rage and with the campus shootings and everything else, it certainly seems like anger is a very important theme, but it's one that's a bit of a blind spot in terms of how people think about uh, health problems and mental health problems. So if we want to uh, unpack the idea of culture-bound syndromes, we'd have to think more carefully about what these different entities are in, in what we're describing. And on the one hand, we have uh, cultural syndromes, uh, which are these groups of symptoms that coexist, uh, and that might or might not be recognized in a community, but an outsider could identify them. And then we have a much broader category of folk illnesses, that is just labels that people are using, which may or may not be syndromes, because a label might be attached simply because uh, a healer says, well, you've got this, you know, and it could manifest in many different ways. Uh, but that's the diagnosis. Uh, you know, if you go to see uh, a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner and they take your five pulses and they tell you you've got an excess of this or that, that's a diagnosis, there are herbs that go with it, uh, but there's no specific uh, syndrome necessarily uh, that's attached to that. There may be. 
Uh, a lot of the terms that have been called culture-bound syndromes are better thought of as what the anthropologist Mark Nichter called idioms of distress. That is, they're languages of suffering that people use. So when my grandmother talked about her nerves bothering her, she didn't literally mean her nerves, and she didn't mean a, a fixed set of symptoms. It's just a common everyday language for talking about suffering. And in fact, nerves is something that exists in different forms. In Greek, in Greek uh, is nevra, in uh, 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 Spanish is uh, nervios. Uh, you've got a variety of different kinds of, of terms that are available to people to talk about suffering. And a, a, a good everyday example in North America these days is depression. So depression, on the one hand, is a syndrome, a medical syndrome, a certain set of symptoms, but it's also an everyday language of distress. It's very usual for people to say, oh, I was so depressed by that exam, it was ridiculous, I don't know what the professor was thinking, and they would just express their you know, uh, d d upset and dissatisfaction that way. So a lot of the terms that got framed as culture-bound syndromes were also these kinds of idioms of distress. And finally, a lot of the uh, things that are called culture-bound syndromes, as I mentioned with the example of SUSTO, are actually explanatory models. If you take the 25 things that are in the DSM and you then ask how do they map onto these different concepts, uh, and this is just a very rough way of doing it, this is uh, kind of a first pass, it's not at all systematic or perhaps not all that accurate, but it does make the point that uh, actually relatively few of them are clear-cut syndromes. Most of them are pop folk or popular categories. Many of them are idioms of distress, and some are causal attributions. And the same term can function in several different ways. And that's very important from a clinical point of view, because if somebody starts telling you in India, uh, they mention dat, which has this implication of losing uh, uh, semen uh, in the urine, uh, and therefore being depleted of energy, because there's this notion that you know, it takes... Um, um, 100 grains of rice to make one drop of blood and 100 drops of blood to make one drop of semen. And if you lose semen, you're losing this tremendous amount of energy. Uh, and so it could be cause of weakness, of nervousness, of all kinds of problems of sexual dysfunction, but not primarily of sexual dysfunction, all kinds of things. Uh, so if somebody expresses that, they may or may not have symptoms. Uh, they, it may be an explanation for what's going on. Uh, and so it can function in different ways. Um, so if you actually then look at all these things, as I say, you can see this is just a rough count, but the most common thing that's going on with those 25 things that were chosen for the DSM is that they are folk categories, and we have to think about them differently, uh, and they are mostly not uh, discrete <coughs> syndromes.